get at the lights. We're going to look at some scriptures this evening, so I want everybody to be able to see and follow along as we continue on with uh, week four of Explore God. And our question tonight is, is Christianity too narrow? Is Christianity too narrow? Now, I mentioned earlier that today was Scout Sunday here at Montrose Baptist Church, and the Cub Scout motto is, anybody know? Cub Scout motto is, do your best. Everybody say that with me. Do your best. Okay, and the Boy Scout motto is, be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. Do your best and be prepared. And I think that's what Explore God is all about. Doing our best to be prepared. Being prepared for this life. Being prepared for the life to come, being prepared to help other people prepare for this life and for the next. That's what this Explore God project is all about. So doing one's best to be prepared involves asking the right questions and seeking out the right answers. So we all have questions, and that's good, but let's not just remain stuck in our questions. Let's be seekers of truth. Let's search out the right answers. Does life have a purpose? And if we say, yes, you know, I believe life does have a purpose, that leads us into, is there a God? And we say, yes, there is a God. And so then we wonder, why does this God allow pain and suffering? And so we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And then as we talk about this good, gracious God, we begin also to wonder about other religions besides Christianity. And so we ask ourselves, is Christianity too narrow? And once we talk about the exclusive claims of Christianity, then we may begin to focus in on Jesus himself and the claims that he makes. Is he really who he says he is? Is Jesus really God? That will be our topic of discussion next Sunday. Is Jesus really God? And since when we ask that question, we'll be examining the claims of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament, we'll naturally want to know, is this book reliable? Is the Bible reliable? And having those questions answered, at least beginning to answer those questions, the final question of our series is, can I know God personally? And I'm going to share with you this evening, from my own experience, you can disagree with everything else I say, but you can't disagree with my experience, right? From my own experience, I can share with you that, yes, you can know God personally, and it is the greatest thing in the world. And I hope the same for you as I have experienced in my own life. So we're doing our best to be prepared by asking the right questions and seeking the right answers. Now, none of you really, some of you knew the, the Boy Scout motto, uh, be prepared. Not everybody knew the Cub Scout motto, do your best. But did you know that these very mottos are found in the pages in the New Testament? How many of you knew that? All right, so let's take a look. Okay. Um, so, first of all, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, do your best. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now that verse, as my Bible college professors would say, is pregnant with meaning. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's full of meaning. Uh, do your best to present yourself as one who is approved in the way that you handle this book. So tonight we want to do our best in how we handle the scriptures. 1 Peter 3.15 also talks about being prepared. We as Christians need to regard Christ the Lord as holy and set apart. And it says always being prepared. Always be prepared to make a ready defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. And the best way to be prepared, the best way to be equipped for ministry in the world today is by getting into this book. By getting into this book, because this is the very God-breathed words. All scripture is inspired, God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped, may have everything they need for every good work as part of this gospel ministry. So, 
This book is what equips us and what helps us to be prepared. So our question today is, is Christianity too narrow? So let's break that question down for a minute. First of all, is Christianity narrow? How many of you would say, yes, Christianity is narrow? Raise your hands. Okay, so a lot of hands, probably half the hands go up. Some of you wonder if it's a trick question. You're wondering if you volunteered for something. Um, okay, is Christianity narrow? And the answer is, you bet it is. You bet it is. Christianity is very, very narrow. Let's consider a few of the very narrow verses of the New Testament. Okay? How about John chapter 14 and verse 6? John chapter 14, verse 6. These are the words of Jesus. They're read in my Bible. And Jesus said to Thomas, I am, and here's one of his I am statements. That in itself is very bold proclamation of Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's excluding people. Yes, Jesus is excluding people. He's saying that you cannot come to the Father. You cannot have a right relationship with God. And Jesus talks more about hell than anybody else. So he's saying that heaven and hell hang in the balance here in your relationship with God. You cannot come to the Father except through me. Jesus makes a truth claim and it is exclusive. It therefore has the potential to exclude so this is a very narrow claim of Jesus. How about John chapter 10, verse 7? John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door or the gate of the sheep. Another bold I am statement. I am the door, the gate. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the door. He's the gate. And you say, well, you know what? That sounds kind of narrow, but the word narrow didn't appear, so I'm going to say that Christianity is not narrow. Okay, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. I believe that Jesus preached sermons like the Sermon on the Mount quite often in his itinerant mission, in his itinerant ministry around Galilee and different places that he would travel so this is like, I hate to use this word, but this is like the stump speech of Jesus, okay? So the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, similar, Jesus declares these things often. This is the heart of his message. Matthew 7, verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, easy or broad. Those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. It's a very narrow statement that Jesus, our Lord, makes. And so if Christianity is christ if Jesus, his teachings, the foundation, then it is very narrow. Very narrow. Jesus said, I am the gate. He says, narrow is the gate. You want to go on the path, the narrow path, you have to enter by me. I am the only way, the truth and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, Acts 4.12, the apostles correctly interpreted and understood this narrow path. Acts 4 and verse 12, Peter says, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name. Say that with me. No other name. One more time. No other name. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's very exclusive. Very narrow. So is Christianity narrow? The answer is you bet it is. Now, is Christianity too narrow? Is it too narrow? And I would say, you decide. You decide. Christianity's truth claim is narrow and exclusive, but so is every other truth claim. The fact of the matter is, truth, by definition, is narrow. Truth, by definition, is 
narrow, and all truth claims have the potential to exclude. Truth claims made by Jesus, truth claims made by other religions, truth claims made by those who see themselves as kind of, of arrogant and over and above all the religions, looking down upon them, saying, oh, they all basically teach the same things, or just, just different perspectives of the same basic sort of thing uh, that is the basic religion in America today. We learned there in our study group earlier uh, that more than 50% of American adults believe that all religions basically teach the same thing. And I'm sure uh, that number, that survey was from 2012 or 2013. I bet that number has gone way up since then. Most people today uh, believe that all religions basically teach the same thing. But what they're doing when they make that statement is an exclusive truth claim. And they are excluding Christians like myself, who don't agree with that, and billions of other people around the world who are faithful adherents of different religions. And so they themselves are making a very narrow claim. In fact, it's not necessarily humble and inclusive, it's rather arrogant, because they're seeing themselves as over and above the fray, looking down upon the humble masses of people who are dazed and confused by their religious beliefs. So, you know, don't let anybody tell you that uh, Christianity is narrow, but, but they're not. They're making some pretty narrow claims as well. So all truth claims have the potential to exclude. Truth by definition is narrow. Tonight we'll see that while truth is narrow, grace is wide. Grace is wide. The invitation goes out to all, but there's only one party, and there's only one way to get to the party even though we're all invited. So truth is indeed narrow, but grace is wide. Grace is wide. In our video this evening earlier, one of the speakers, I believe his name was Corey, said, quote, when people say all religions are the same, that sounds tolerant, it sounds humble, but in reality it's kind of an arrogant claim. It's kind of like saying you're in the position of a king looking down, seeing the whole picture and each of the religious only sees a part of it. And the fact of the matter is we're all exclusivists. We're all making exclusive claims. Exclusive claims that make a statement about fundamental, ultimate reality and have the potential to exclude. So Judaism and Islam believe that God is one. Christianity also believes that God is one, but that he is three in one. He's a triunity, one God in three persons. Hinduism believes that God is many. Secular humanism believes that there is no God. There is no afterlife. Progressive, self-made American religion believes that all religions are pretty much the same. Uh, they're superficially different, but essentially the same. A claim which disrespects and really looks down upon the beliefs of billions of people and adherents all over the world. So the fact of the matter is, we're all making exclusive claims about the truth. Why do I belabor that point? You say, come on, okay, we get it, we get it. I, I belabor that point because it's not until you admit that your claim to truth is exclusive, and I admit, yes, my claim to truth in Jesus is exclusive, then we can have a conversation about my truth claim versus your truth claim. Then we can begin to discuss what I believe makes my truth claim a better description of ultimate <laughs> reality and why I think that there are holes in your truth. But you know what? I'll, I'll listen to you as you share those same perspectives with me. So tolerance. Tolerance is something that we emphasize, rightfully emphasize in our culture. I mean, the 20th century was, was the bloodiest century in the whole history of the world. You know, great technological movements and innovations and different forms of government and things that came upon the world scene, people thought they were going to usher in a new utopia, a millennium, and instead we had more billions and billions of people slaughtered in the name of government, in the name of religion, in the name of many, many different things in the 20th century more than in any other century of human history. And so I think people respond to that by emphasizing it and rightfully emphasizing tolerance. Tolerance is good and necessary, but let's realize that narrow does not mean intolerant, nor does it mean arrogant. Narrow is clear, it's concise, it's decisive, it's attainable, it's a good thing. It doesn't mean it lacks love. In fact, narrowness is a part of love. So this coming 
Thursday, I believe. Is that correct? Thursday is Valentine's Day. I plan to uh, take my lovely wife, uh, perhaps out for dinner on Valentine's Day. Sometimes we won't do it on the actual day because it's such a busy day. And we don't want to disrespect Ron's birthday in any way either. So, uh, so anyway, so I don't know if we'll go out on the actual day. It might be a different day. But, but we, we have plans on probably going out and enjoying some time together. Uh, how do you think Tanya would feel in our love relationship if I invited a couple other ladies and maybe a guy friend to join us? Well, Valentine's Day date, a couple other ladies there, and a guy friend there, you know, no, of course not. That would be completely unacceptable. My, my love uh, is very narrow, and it's focused right on that lady sitting over there. So, and that's appropriate, and that's good. So, narrowness is a good thing. Is Christianity narrow? Everybody down there happy? Yes, it is. Is Christianity too narrow? Well, I don't think it is, but that's up to you to decide. Before you write out the claims of Christ as too narrow and too exclusive, just remember that in writing him off, in writing me and my beliefs off, you're excluding me and you yourself are being narrow. We're all narrow because truth by definition is narrow. Now, Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the light. He claims to be God in the flesh, the Savior of the world, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He says that way is narrow, but he invites us to walk with him in the way. Truth is narrow. Grace is wide. Jesus invites everyone to the party. The invitation goes out to all. It's not unloving for Christians to hit the streets and want to share Jesus. It's not unloving for Christians to want to share Jesus with their family members and friends. And even though people might not like it when we talk about Jesus, I hope we do it in the right way, in a grace-filled kind of way, a good news gospel kind of way. But we're simply inviting you all to the party. As Christians, when we invite others to come to know Jesus, it's like saying, I got this great invitation to a party, and I accepted it, and I... It's just incredible, and the people I care about, the people I love, I want them to come to the party with me. But not everyone accepts the invitation. But I don't believe anyone can say they weren't invited. Let's take a look at the claims of Jesus, some of the claims of Jesus. And we're going to uh, turn to John, the Gospel of John. And uh, we'll look, uh, first of all, look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. So Jesus is having debates with the religious leaders in and around Jerusalem, and uh, John will often refer to them as the Jews. Uh, he's talking about the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, uh, all these sorts of people. Uh, so in John chapter 8, verse uh, 47, Jesus says, whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And his Jewish opponents answer him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and that you have a demon? So essentially they're calling Jesus a very racist, racial slur and saying that he's demon-possessed. Uh, when you share Jesus with others, when you're bold and making exclusive truth things about Jesus, people are going to say mean things about you. They're going to call you mean names or assume mean things because of something that they didn't experience personally but they heard about and think that all Christians are that way. They might even think that you're crazy or that you are under some kind of demonic influence in this case. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The religious leader said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who are you, Jesus, to be claiming these things? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. Wow. Jesus is getting pretty harsh, isn't he? He is. <laughs> wow. I'd be a liar 
are just like you if I claim not to know God, but I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Oh, boy, this really stoked them up. So they said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you're going to tell us that you've seen Abraham? <laughs> Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, and I bet he paused for dramatic effect and looked each one of them in the eye as he declared, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now that's a very bold thing for Jesus to say because he's claiming to be God. He's claiming to be the one true Lord. He's claiming to be Yahweh. Jehovah. How did the Lord reveal himself to Moses in the burning bush? I am who I am. This is the name of the Lord. And on five occasions in the Gospel of John, Jesus is recorded as declaring himself to be the I am. He also makes some beautiful I am metaphorical statements. I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. I am the good shepherd. I am, says Jesus, the light of the world. So how did his opponents respond to him? Oh, I guess you are crazy. Well, we'll talk to you later. No. <laughs> they picked up stones to throw at him, to kill him. A horrible way of execution. They'd throw stones at him, pelting him. It would hurt a lot, and finally somebody would take a large stone and crush it over his head so he died. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple area. Wow, this is this is this is amazing. This interaction Jesus has. Jesus claimed to be the Lord. Uh, John chapter ten. Let's turn over there. John chapter ten. Hopefully you got your Bibles open. We're going to go through a lot of this chapter. John chapter ten. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. So picture a sheepfold made out of brick where the, the sheep can safely be gathered together, and there is a one entranceway. And that entranceway uh, is where the shepherd and those who have authority will, uh, will go in. And that's also the entranceway where the sheep can exit and go out and go out to pasture and that kind of thing. But... That sheepfold represents the people who belong to the shepherd, where they are kept safe. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers." And the people, as Jesus is talking, are a little confused. The figure of speech didn't make sense to them. They didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus repeats himself. He says again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door. I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. So others who've made a claim to be Messiah, they're thieves, they're robbers. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, thieves and robbers, only in it for their own glory. I am, I am the gate, I am the door. The sheep did not listen to them because I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and that they may have abundantly. Jesus came so that we would not only have salvation from sins and the hope of heaven, but that right now we might experience true life, life the way it's meant to be, abundant life. Joy and peace and love and contentment and purpose and meaning. This is the kind of abundant life that Jesus came to bring to us. He says, I am the good what? The good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life for his sheep. John 10 verse 12. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd... Who does not own the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, what does he do? He leaves. He flees. He cares nothing for the sheep. He's just a hired hand. 
But what does the shepherd do? The shepherd doesn't let the wolf snatch and scatter the sheep because he cares nothing for the sheep. No, the shepherd, the good shepherd, knows his sheep. Jesus says, I know my own, and my own know me. It's not religion, it's relationship. Say that with me. It's not religion, it's relationship. Care less, couldn't care less about all the man-made traditions that have been passed down for 2,000 years since Jesus. In fact, Christianity is a constant renewal movement, and as century upon century of religious junk piles up upon the New Testament, we have to constantly be clearing away the junk and getting back to the Word of God and back to a relationship with God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not religion, it's relationship. And traditions are nice, traditions are nice, but man, don't go to a church that makes tradition a capital T. And I hope our church won't do that, because we've got to constantly be renewing our minds by the scriptures and renewing our practices by the scriptures and constantly be going back to the word of God. Councils, creeds, man-made traditions, and stuff like that. You know what they're important to know about? They're important, they're important in many ways. So let's not discard them completely, but we've got to get back to the Word of God. And sometimes we've got to cut through the crud that we have created over the years to get back to what's essential and what matters most. So Jesus says that I know them and they know me. I am the good shepherd, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life in the sheep. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. He's talking about Gentiles. They will be welcomed into the fold of the sheep of God, the people of God, the flock of God. Jews, Gentiles, one flock with one shepherd. One people of God with one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, within the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. For this reason the Father loves me, because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority, says Jesus, to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. Jesus has divine authority, not only to willingly lay down his life, but to take it up again. What do we call the event where Jesus takes up his life again? Resurrection. The resurrection. Next week we'll take a closer look at the resurrection because Christianity stands or falls on the historical veracity, the historical reliability of this resurrection claims. If Jesus is not raised, we might as well just close the church down and go do something better on Sundays. But if Jesus is raised, let us serve him and live for him with everything we've got because we're going to see him and we're going to report to him one day. John 10, verse 19 there was again division among the Jewish leaders because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. Others of them said, he is insane. Who will listen to this guy? You know, when we consider the claims of Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, what about these claims that Jesus is making? Uh, what do you think? Is he a lunatic? Is he crazy? Demon-possessed? And what's going on here? He claims to be God in the flesh. He claims to have the power to, to lay down his life and to take it up again. Is he, is he crazy? Most of us was, would never dare say that Jesus is crazy. Most people, even those who aren't Christians, respect the teachings of Jesus and the person of Jesus. And um, you know, Only somebody who's really got their, their head buried in the sand would ever deny the historical fact that there was a Jesus who really lived and who really died. So he's not a lunatic. What about a liar? Is he a liar? A charlatan? Is he just misleading people? Is Jesus simply telling lies? Again, most people respect Jesus as a this very good moral teacher at the very least. Uh, so people aren't willing to call him a lunatic or a liar. How about a legend? How about a legend? Is it just kind of like one person that really met Jesus, told somebody else about Jesus, and then over centuries of time, this person tells that person kind of like the gossip telephone game that we play as kids, and, and pretty soon the legend gets built up, and, uh, and, and people today are believing something that's not even close to being accurate to the historical 
Jesus? Is Jesus just a legend? Well, again, we'll consider this more when we talk about the reliability of the Bible. But we have actual fragments of Scripture, actual pieces of papyrus that are only like a hundred years after the events they describe in the Gospels. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have what historians will rightly note to be a very early Christian creed written by the Apostle Paul. Nobody doubts that. In which he describes the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And then he details all the people Jesus appeared to, including 500 people at one time. Now let me tell you, 500 people at one time do not have the same hallucination. You can't have the same hallucination with 500 people at the exact same time. And then the Apostle Paul says, many of these people are still living. So if you don't take my word for it, go investigate. Go ask them yourselves. These words were written just a couple of decades after these events that took place in Jerusalem. And so he's not a lunatic. He's not a liar. He's not a legend. Is he Lord? That's what we're left with. That Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. That Jesus is Lord. Amen. I believe he is. I believe he is. We all, Mark believes he is. We all believe he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to live like it and proclaim it. The boldness of holy love proclaiming the gospel. That Jesus is indeed Lord. You know, really quickly... When we consider lots of world, re world religions and different worldviews, a worldview is kind of like the filter through which we, we take all the data that we receive and filter it through to understand it properly. And Christianity, biblical Christianity, is a worldview, one that I live by and many here in this room live by. But how do we evaluate truth claims? How do we evaluate different worldviews, different world religions? Ronnie Zacharias says good points about this. First of all, he says that we evaluate them based on four criteria. Four criteria. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin. What does this worldview, this religion, say about where we come from? Where the universe comes from? Christianity is very clear that God is eternal, that he spoke the universe into existence and he created us in his own image. Male and female created in God's image. Origin. What about meaning? Is there a purpose? Is there a meaning? What is that purpose? What is that meaning? We were planned for God's pleasure. We were created to bring him glory. So we're very clear that yes, there is a purpose. Yes, there is a meaning. And even, even pain and suffering and difficult things that we go through, we know that God has a purpose. God has a plan. Even if, if we don't see his hand at work, we can trust his heart. Because we know that he's doing something. So there's a purpose, there's a plan, there's meaning. How about morality? First of all, can this worldview explain why there is right and wrong? We as Christians believe that right and wrong are defined by the very character of God. And how do we know what is right and wrong? Well, we know because we're created in God's image, and so we have a conscience. And that conscience is a reminder of the character of God stamped upon us. We also have the revealed word of God in which we read about his ways and his will and his desires for us. So how do other worldviews, other religions define morality, where it comes from and how we know what is right and wrong? And then destiny, where are we going? Where are we headed? For those of us who trust in Christ, we believe that the moment that our physical life ends, or the moment that Jesus returns, and we see him face to face, we will pass into a, a place so wonderful Jesus calls it paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we, in the glory of paradise, will await the day of resurrection where we will live with glorified bodies, brand new bodies, worshiping, serving, glorifying our God forever and ever on a new earth, earth the way that it was meant to be. So that's what we look forward to, our destiny. And we can evaluate worldviews based on logical consistency, 
based on empirical adequacy and experiential relevancy. Rabbi Zacharias says, quote, the fundamental difference that you see in Jesus Christ is the uniqueness and the exclusivity of his claims and the embrace that he gives to all humanity. The perfection of his life. The purity of his life. The sacrificial death upon the cross for our sins. The triumphant resurrection from the grave. To me, says Rabbi Zacharias, to me, that coherence of his answers convinces me that he is who he claimed to be. And truth, by definition, is exclusive. All truth claims to be exclusive. Buddhism claims to be exclusive. Hinduism claims to be exclusive. They all have exclusivity built into them, but in the person of Christ you see the demonstration in birth, life, death, and resurrection. He concludes, I am convinced that because it coheres and because I have personally verified it in my own life, you can do that too and find that experience that he is indeed who he claimed to be. When you accept the invitation, the scripture says that to all who receive and to all who believe in his name, he gave the right, the power, the authority to become children of God. We become adopted into God's family and we experience that relationship. Jesus says, it's on the screen, to my right, to my left, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He's talking there to people who need to repent. People who need to turn from their sins and open the door. Open the door. The invitation is broad. Goes out to all, but not everyone accepts. Truth is narrow, grace is wide. And I'm so happy for God's wideness of grace in my life. This past week on Thursday, uh, February 7th, a very special day to me. The next day, my mom called on the phone and she said, Hey, Jason, happy belated spiritual birthday. How was your day yesterday? <laughs> spiritual birthday, what's that all about? February 7th. 1981 is the day that I remember as just a little boy in my family's living room in Waterloo, Michigan. The green carpet, the tacky gold couch, but it was real soft, <laughs> real comfortable to lay on. Uh, but I remember that, that gold-colored couch. I knelt there on my knees and I folded my hands and I prayed along with my brother and my parents as they led me. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned, and I'm sorry. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you live today. Please, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. And I remember afterwards, everybody was all excited, and all smiles, and we went down to our family room in the basement, and we had uh, heart-shaped cookies. I think they were Snoopy, uh, Charlie Brown cookies, uh, Valentine's Day cookies. And we celebrated this wonderful, wonderful event in my life. And, and as the years went by, I came to know more about Jesus and his love for me, and I came to love him more in return. A few years later, I was baptized, and I remember going under the water and coming out, and just for the first time, a true sense of the joy of the Lord, and just like a warmness from my, from my head to my toes. And everybody's experience is different, but I really felt, you know, God the Father, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And on the way out to church that night, I told my mom as I was holding her hand, Mom, I think God wants me to be a pastor or a missionary one day. And God's been so faithful and so gracious in my life. And so, like I said earlier, you can disagree with, with what I had to say about Scripture, about Christianity, the claims of Jesus, but you can't disagree with my experience. And that's real to me, and it can be real for you as well. Truth is narrow, but grace is wide. Jesus stands at the door of your heart knocking. Humbly, humbly let him in. Open the door. Receive Jesus. And you too can experience the abundant life that Jesus offers to all who believe in him. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to lead in the prayer. And if you would like to, perhaps for the very first time, receive Jesus, I invite you to do so at this time. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And you can repeat these words after me in your own heart. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I say 
think and do things that are wrong. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you live today. You conquered the grave. And I call out to you, Jesus. Save me. Save me. Trusting that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So Jesus, please come into my heart. And lead me as my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer with me tonight, I hope that you will talk to me after the service. I also want to share some words of encouragement to you as the band comes at this time. A few words from John chapter 10. Jesus is talking about those sheep. <laughs> if you pray to receive Jesus as your Savior, you become one of his flock, one of his sheep. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. A Christian is somebody who follows Jesus, who knows Jesus. It's not religion, it's relationship. Follow. No. He says, I give them eternal life. And Jesus doesn't give and take it back. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me. He is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of his hand. And I and the Father are one, says Jesus. Let me tell you, if you are trusting in Jesus as your Savior, you are held tightly in his grip. And no one, not yourself, not the evil one, not circumstances around you, not those who doubt and those who are skeptical about your commitment to Christ, no one can snatch you out of Jesus' hands. You are held tightly in his hands. The scripture says that no one and nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. I believe that tonight. And so we're going to stand together and sing, How Can It Be? Let's consider how Jesus has saved us and how we have a message to tell to those around us. Let's sing together.